Hello. If you're watching this video, there are probably th one of three reasons. One, you're in my one, my organizational communication class, and you have accidentally found this video instead. This video is for rhetoric 380, not organizational communication 330. So if you're in my 330 class, uh, this is the wrong video. If for some reason you're still watching it, um, you're twisted, and you are trying to learn too much. The second possibility is um, that just because I said midget porn right then, uh, the voice recognition software inside of YouTube uh, tagged me as having said midget porn, and you aren't in my class, but were searching for midget porn and have found my video instead. Um, there will be no more midget porn, probably no even more no mention of it uh, from this point on, so sorry. Uh, next video. Um, the last possibility is that you're in my rhetoric class, and uh, that's comp 380. Sorry, I'm just adjusting here. Oh, oh that's just perfect. Anyway, the last possibility is that you're in my rhetoric class, and this is the video that you are supposed to be watching. Anyway, so here's how it's going to work. I'm going to publish uh, these things in a series of videos, probably three or four parts per idea. And those three or four videos will basically account for one whole class. And this will make it easier for me to record and make you easy for, easier for you to watch. So this is the first video in a series that we're going to call the rhetoric of science. Okay? The rhetoric of science, part one. Here we go. Rhetoric was really important for almost 2,000 years, starting with the rise of the Greek politics, say 600 BC, all the way through 1700 AD. Rhetoric was one of the most important of academic pursuits. You were an excellent academic if you studied rhetoric. And it was one of the things that was responsible for the creation of ideas and being able to analyze rhetoric, analyze other people's rhetoric, and create your own rhetoric was part of what marked an excellent thinker. That was challenged by the scientific revolution and the rise of a philosophical movement known as logical positivism. Logical positivism, uh, sort of roughly defined, is just a notion that there's a separation between our ideas and the way that we talk about them. Um, and so it's a, it's a skepticism towards language uh, and basically an understanding that how we think about things is different than how we talk about things. And that what we want to do as scientists is come to an excellent understanding of things regardless of the, the words that we use to get there. Uh, now this sort of drove a wedge uh, between the creation of knowledge and the presentation of knowledge. So, uh, in this first video, I want to a uh, present to you this picture of science as objective. Science as objective, all right? Um, and an objective study uh, is one that focuses on true things that are always true, and they're true because they sort of connect to the world. On the one hand, you have objective truths, um, which are real, always, uh, and the reason they're real is because they're connected to an object in the world. And then there's subjective knowledge, which is sort of a sloppier human thing, and it's uh, based off of emotions and interpretations and other stuff. And so uh, scientists have tried to move from the subjective to the objective and try to found their truths in uh, like what is universally true, always true. No matter how you think about it or, or no, how, no matter how you talk about it, present it, or interpret it, they're looking for solid truths. Now, um, this makes rhetoric uh, a little outdated. Let's take the sophists, right? You know, sort of the, the forefathers of the discipline of rhetoric. They believed that they could take the weaker argument and make it the stronger, right? Which is precisely the opposite of science. See, science is let the, the argument stand for itself, let the truth stand for itself, and the argument is irrelevant. See, because you should believe it because it's true, not because I'm convincing. Um, and if you don't believe it, it's because you're dumb. Right, because if you're a good scientist, you would recognize that it was good science, and it, you'd almost persuade yourself. So understanding science, as a, understanding science as an objective pursuit makes rhetoric somewhat irrelevant. There's no need for persuasion. 
the authority doesn't come from the speaker, nor does it come from the persuasiveness of the argument, but it's embedded in the truth. Authority flows out of the truthfulness of an objective claim. And this is true. I mean, think about, of all the people that you know, who can get you to take your pants off the fastest? It's the doctor, right? I mean, I can have a conversation with anybody, and in 10 minutes, very few people can get my pants off. But if I go to the doctor with a pain in my groin, and I say, Doc, I have a pain in my groin, and he says, take, me, take, take your pants off. 10 minutes after the conversation has started, wham, there I am, standing, pantsless. And it's not because he's terribly persuasive. I mean, he could be funny looking, or she could be funny looking. It doesn't even matter, right? Um, but all of the normal things that would normally persuade me to take my pants off all sort of get trumped. Because what, what the, 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 the doctor is, they're sort of a, they're a scientist. And if I expose them to the right experience, right, if I give them the empirical data, namely me standing there with my pants off, they will compare that to the objective medical truth that they know, and they will be able to make a reasoned argument as to what the cause of the pain in my groin is, right? Objective truths are convincing. Um, so wh when you understand science as an objective pursuit, science as objective, rhetoric becomes unnecessary. There really isn't rhetoric in science because the science stands on its own. In fact, any rhetoric that exists inside science is actually an aberration. It shouldn't exist. Scientists who are trying to persuade you are being bad scientists because the truth of it should stand alone. Right? Um, now, as you can see, this has uh, had an impact on the way people create knowledge, and it has an impact on the way that we study rhetoric, um, because it's basically stolen invention, right, which one of the one of the most canons, out of the discipline of rhetoric, and it now exists inside of the, the domain of science. Um, and there are a lot of good things. Let me sort of defend this position. Um, early scientists had to fight against philosophers and theologians, and um, logical positivism is sort of born out of a distrust for language. It's basically saying, you know, if we're going to say that all knowledge is bent up in discourse, right, if, if, if my knowledge is embedded in the way that I say it, then, you know, really smart and nerdy people who would otherwise be creating great knowledge are going to be ignored. And so creating an intellectual pursuit that was not all social, social pursuit is particularly useful. Um, it should also be said that there are ways in which science is not symbolic, right? It's referential, and so all scientific ideas should refer to an actual object in the world. And so in that way, even though when a word refers to something, the one word symbolizes the other, they're going to want to look for real direct uh, synonymies, right? They're not, they're not going to look for art. Um, they're not going to look for beautiful ways of understanding things. They want to look for true, accurate, and precise ways of understanding things. So in some ways, um, right, this, this picture of science as objective is really trying to achieve uh, a kind of language that is it, it very, very sparsely symbolic and not persuasive in any way, or rather, no mechanisms other than the truthfulness of the claim as persuasive. So, a few questions, and you can write them in the comments below. Um, do you think that science is objective, or do you think that, no, it's still a subjective pursuit? Now, if you think it's objective, do you think that rhetoric plays a role, or would you agree with the logical, logical positivists and say that, no, science needs to be kept out? Even if you agree with the logical positivists that you think it should be, do you think that it can be? Or rather, do you think, now even though it should be kept out, it's, it's inevitable that uh, rhetoric is going to sneak its way in. It's done by people. Anyway, uh, that wraps up part one. Uh, stay tuned for the rhetoric of science part two, where we will talk about science as discipline. All right, comment. Answer my questions. Is science objective? What do you think? All right.